humanist and doing doing that well, I think. Uh, at least I'm trying. Now look at you introducing yourself before I hit record. Shame on oh, you. <laughs> sorry. I can do it again. Okay, so <clears throat> we're live. Hello, everyone out there and Facebook land, YouTube as well. This video will be posted on YouTube very shortly. I have I have two for two for, for you this today. Don't get so excited because you are seeing two people on the screen with me today. I have been very privileged to to uh, to know these two people, Jocelyn and David, and they are from Florida, which is a part of the United States for all of you guys out there who weren't aware that Florida is still a part of the state. Uh, welcome, you guys. So please tell me a little bit about yourselves, and then we're going to get right into it because we have a lot of great content. David, why don't you go first? Okay. All right. So um, it all started back in 2011 when I was on a dating website and I met Jocelyn. That was on okcupid.com and I was in Sarasota and was working with a local skeptics group and a humanist and atheist group down there. And we met and fell in love and uh, the rest is history. So that's the short version. Um, <laughs> so the you long version- You don't know how lucky you are because there's not a lot of women in this community out there. There was, a, there was exactly eight women on, um, on, on Match.com at that time, who actually had atheists on their profile in the entire state. So I'm, I'm sure things have changed anyway. Um, but uh, so, but anyway, I was I was uh, uh, very happy to be able to to uh, uh, convince uh, Jocelyn that we needed to do some activism in Central Florida. And uh, in 2012, we started a group called the Central Florida Free Thought Community, which is a chapter of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and has since become uh, an affiliate of American Atheists and an affiliate of the American Humanist Association. So um, also I do some uh, national service as well for the, uh, I'm an FFRF um, state representative uh, and also a member of the, the advisory board for the Free Thought Equality Fund. Can you, can you explain briefly what a humanist is? Because there, there's a whole group of people out there who are probably watching this going, humanists, is that, sure. they believe in humans? Sure. I'll, yeah. I'll defer to Jocelyn, though, because she plays the, she, we do the good cop, bad cop, and she's the, the humanist, so I'll okay. let her do okay. that in her I'll intro. Introduce yourself. Okay, hi. Yes, uh, David. David David got to share our, our dating experience. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I, I think I would add to the story to say that uh, part of Part of what we started with was activism. So the Central Florida Free Thought community really did start off as an activist organization. Uh, we, we saw infractions going on um, and I, I was always interested, but uh, I'm actually a, a university professor as, as a career and I wasn't actively involved in community organizing beyond some volunteer work here and there and, and things like that. And as we developed our activism, it became apparent that there was a need for a group, a community. Um, people were really seeking out a way to come together. Um, I, at that time, I had a child in elementary school. And so um, I started a group called the Science League for Kids, uh, which we, I could talk more about. I'll just throw that off to the side. We can talk more about it. Yeah. It was a, a successful, a successful group that came out of that. And there's a story that goes with that. Uh, and at the same time, we, we started changing the type of meetings we were having from just let's Let's learn about activism and go do activism to let's educate people. Let's, uh, you know, have topics on science and skepticism. Let's have talks on humanism. Um, humanism is uh, basically uh, it's it's a for me, I, and I'm a third generation atheist. My my grandparents identified as non-believers. My parents identify openly as atheists. Wow. They're very proud about it. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, and I could talk more about my my person. I also lived overseas, so I've been exposed to a lot of different religions, but none of them stuck, I guess you could say. Uh, so basically, you're, we're we're stressing the value, the the potential. Humanists are stressing the the value and potential of human beings for goodness. Uh, we're looking at common human needs as a driver of decision making. Uh, we're using science and research to make decisions. So an example I, I like to, to give is, for example, we used to think it was totally fine for children to start working in the fields at age 11 and 12, if not younger, and that was uh, the norm. And as we, we learned, no, they're still developing, it's, it's better to give them time and, and education and you know, women's rights and children's rights and things like that. We change and evolve over time, which is something that I think is really wonderful about humanism. 
Um, and so I, I, I'm a humanist celebrant. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of the Humanist Society. Uh, I'm the president of the Florida Humanist Association. And I, I think that humanism is something that can hopefully unite a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, because I, I think we have more in common than we have apart, I guess, mm -hmm. to put it in a kind of broad, totally agree. yeah, a hallmark sort of way of putting it. <laughs> so uh, that, that's kind of, uh, I guess, me in a nutshell. Um, I mean, I've been involved with some other groups as well. I'm, I'm the state uh, director for American Atheists for the state of Florida. Um, I'm with David on the FFRF. We're, we're both working for the state of Florida. Um, I'm trying to think what other groups I'm involved with. I, you know, once you start developing a group, then, then, then you thing. start, yes, we know all these people. So why don't we just help all these different groups? They, they all learn that you guys are doers and they're like, oh, we want them on our team. <laughs> That's kind, it's kind, it's kind of, of how it's worked out. Yeah. I think it's fantastic to be able to be associated with so many different great organizations. It's probably very time consuming. <laughs> it is, but it's so worth it. I mean, and and every and I, I'll let David speak. Sorry, it, the, the, each one of them brings you know a, a unique packet that you can work with. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to go uh, to this rally or you're going to go do this, then you might want to pick and choose from different materials, you know, and suit for for the environment that you're in. Anyway, go ahead, David. Sorry. Oh no, you did a great job of summarizing kind of the the, the issues there, and I would only add uh, two of the groups that I think I'm most proud of being a part of. Uh, Jocelyn and I are both on the uh, Interfaith Council of Central Florida, which is going through some changes right now, um, but we're both participating in that very actively. I'm actually on the board of directors of that organization, and I'm also on the commission for um, uh, religious liberty here in Central Florida. Uh, and, and so I think that, that the local activism that we've been involved in for uh, separation of religion and government, as well as uh, humanist clergy members and the Invocation Project, which I hope we'll talk more about, yeah. um, have, have really elevated us into the position of uh, peers of local clergy. The ones that get to know us appreciate us. The ones that don't yet know us are skeptical. Fantastic. I am making a couple notes of things that I, do, I definitely want to talk to you guys about, and I don't want to forget them because I know how these conversations go, and you just get like off onto a tangent, and the next thing you know, you're like, okay, I'm done, and then you're all like, I'm about to ask these Well, we only have four hours, so we better get going. <laughs> as long as we have a break to go to the bathroom, I'm fine That's with right. that. That's right. We'll take turns. <laughs> we'll take turns. There's three of us. Everybody takes a turn. You, you're, you get the screen. It's all yours now. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Where should we start? I am really interested in a lot of different things. And I kind of want to know, what is what is the, um, you know, we hear a lot about Florida and how it is an extremely religious state, um, you know, as opposed to some of the others that might be a little less, like, um, you know, New York might be considered a little more cosmopolitan. And for some reason, it, it isn't as, doesn't feel like it's in the news as much as uh, Florida is. What is it, what's the state of, uh, I don't know how you want to say it, religiosity, or um, are you getting a lot of back push against um, church and state separation? Give me a feeling of what's going on over there right now. It, I'd say it's 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 hard to compare, right? People talk about where they've lived um, in knowledgeably, and they don't talk very knowledgeably about where they haven't lived. I've lived in a lot of places, but not as a full-grown adult, right? Florida has been my life for about 25 years now or 23 years now. And it, so it's hard for me to just compare it to other places other than statistically. And that information is out there. And I will say that, that demographically, when it comes to religion, we mirror the national uh, status or the national data pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but of course, we all enjoy talking about how you ask the question about your non-belief. And we feel like if you ask the question the right way or the wrong way, you can get a higher or lower number of non-believers. But I think, you know, Orlando is certainly very different than uh, Lakeland. Central Florida is certainly different than North Florida, which is different than South Florida. Um, so we kind of have, you know, the, the stereotypes of, you know, humanist and free thought and atheist and skeptics groups across the state. And we, we kind of generalize things about South Florida and Southwest Florida and North Florida. And, and, and those aren't always helpful, but it's nice to be able to connect the groups and leaders in those areas. And we've actually got an event coming up next weekend where we'll do that, where we have the uh, Florida Secular Leadership Summit, which is a biennial event. And we'll bring people from across Florida together, this time virtually. Uh, we've got about 35 signed up right now, and we usually have 40 or 50 to talk about what we need to do as local groups to get organized and do a better job 
uh, around the state. So I think for the most part, you're going to have your rural versus urban and suburban in the middle type of demographics, where you've got red counties and blue counties and purple counties. So it, it's as expected, um, but certainly I think we get in the news a lot because we've got a lot of sunshine laws. So you, you hear a lot about the Florida man and Florida woman stories because there's so much information out there from the the police and the sheriff's offices about who gets arrested, which can be good and can be bad. I, I, I would add to that. First of all, I would recommend that if you wanted to learn more about this, I would talk to Dr. Ryan Cragen, who's a professor of sociology um, over in Tampa. He's spoken several times at Free Flow. Um, he's written a few books um, and he would probably be able to give you actual numbers on this. Mm -hmm. Anecdotally, the groups that we that I've talked to have basically gone from the people down in the Miami area saying, we don't really see the need, need to talk about state church separation as much as community because we don't feel like there's a problem because down in Miami, they're not perceiving it as a problem. You, you work your way up to central Florida, which would go all the way from Orlando to Tampa. And, and you see a, a real mix depending on the, the suburb or city. Um, as far as, and, and I'm basing this in part off of our invocations and the areas, you know, the, the cities that have been really open to it and the cities where that, that have been more uh, difficult to, to accept our invocations. And then you move your way up to the state and as expected, in my opinion, you get up to the panhandle and it's, it's in my opinion, quite conservative. And this is my anecdotal perspective of the state of Florida. Stereotype is that it's the deep South when you get to North Florida. Right. Is, is, is that because um, they, they tend to be less cause, you know, culturally, culturally diverse or. I think all of the typical th reasons, don't you, Jocelyn? I mean, it's, it's, I, a, it's I think a southern. It's income. Yeah, yeah, that too, for sure. Yeah, there's They're definitely poor. less urban and suburban areas up there. The towns are middle sized and smaller. There's a lot more connection to the to the south. Right. The, the, the old south, uh, not necessarily the negative old south, but just the tradition of the south. Um, affecting North Florida a lot more than it affects Central Florida and, and the Tampa Bay area and the Naples and Southwest Florida area and of course South Florida which is what we refer to as kind of Miami North through Vero and Stewart but the um, you know it, it, it I think it's a lot like in any other place right where you have a lot of people moving in you have a lot more diversity and where you don't you don't right so wherever you have interstates you're going to have more people and there's places where, you know, that happens pretty specifically related to local development, related to historical, you know, city actions that the Bay areas of Jacksonville and Tampa are going to be producing more business because of the ports and stuff there. So it's, it's your standard, you know, kind of demographic breakdown based on development over the years. Education in Florida is not as, I think we're what, 47th? We're not. The, the, the I thought quality we were fifty of, something. Yeah, we could be fifty fifth. <laughs> yeah, based on Florida statistics. Thank um, God yeah. for Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I definitely think that plays a role. And when you, and when I, when I talk about uh, income and poverty, I, I, I'm not saying that someone who doesn't have an education is not necessarily going to be educated on these topics, but the quality of education that the children, the kids are receiving are not going to include conversations about these things at all. It's not going to have an open atmosphere so that uh, the LGBTQ, you know, IA plus club can open up, things like that. That's not going to be in schools that can't afford enough teachers and things like that. And Florida's really does not treat their teachers very well. And there, there are places period. in central and south Florida that are more rural and more like, you know, those those North Florida counties where there's um, less urban areas, less suburban areas, less diversity. So it's not just north south thing. It's really related to suburbia and, and the development. I think yeah, education are... and tax rolls, right? I mean, we're, when we oh, pay yeah. taxes into the school system based on our property values, we get what we have now, which is extreme diversity across the, the spectrum and, and bad education where there's not much taxes and good education where there is. And certainly some good school districts and good people have made differences for sure. Right. So you were both had said that you've lived elsewhere. And I know Jocelyn had said she'd lived overseas. The, the idea I, from at least in my, my knowledge, anecdotally, the more you travel, the more you are uh, forced to work with or be around people with other cultures, other religiosities or lack thereof, um, even going to college and having to interact with people who, who kind of challenge your worldviews. This is really a, a, a great way of uh, breaking down barriers and getting people to uh, accept the idea that maybe the religion that they were raised in is, you know, 
I, I believe in this religion because I've always been in it. I've never known anybody who wasn't in this religion. And now all of a sudden I'm meeting people who aren't and who maybe are completely different types of religions. So foreign to mine, maybe, you know, an Asian religion of some sort, um, Hindu religion. <laughs> and I think that that might be part of what's going on. If you're living on a coast where you have a lot of interaction with people from other cultures, or you are traveling for college or traveling with your family. But, you know, if you get into an isolated community where people don't really go anywhere. I That's know. true. I, I would hope that the internet's helping with that. I mean, just in general, um, whether it be atheism or any other topic, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've opened the, the floodgates of, of information. And so hopefully a lot of this is going to be correcting itself. But I, I definitely agree. Exposure to people of different beliefs of any sort are going to, I believe, open our minds. Mm -hmm. um, I, I moved 18 times the first 18 years of my oh, life. you were military? No, 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 no. Oh. My, my, my father is very not military, uh, oh. but he, he, he stayed home and took care of me while he was finishing his master's while my mom, um, she already had her master's, was teaching English, and he was finishing his master's in history. And so for the first five years, my dad took care of me and I, and I was raised in such a way that I, they, they, they didn't want me to have Barbie dolls, for example, they didn't want gender stereotypes to be, really? to be, yeah, they were a little extreme in some ways. Um, but now they've really mellowed out with age. Um, anyway, <laughs> you don't, you don't have to straighten that out. They're not watching. <laughs> <laughs> they could though. They could, they well, we're all on Facebook. Um, that's right. It's Facebook. That's right. It is Facebook. And then, um, I went to Denmark for a year. Uh, I decided when I was about 13 or 14, I was pissed off that my parents had had my brothers. And so I got a job. I actually uh, was not completely honest on my, on my very, I, I made myself older and started working and saved my money and went to Denmark. I, I found it. Yeah, I figured I'd blend in um, <laughs> at the time. Uh, then I, I came back and my parents had moved to Florida. Uh, and I was like, where have you moved me to? This is horrible. I absolutely hated it. Um, but I ended up getting my undergraduate degree at UCF and then went to What's Japan, UCF? At the University of Central Florida, which is now second largest in the country. It's massive. They've got like 65,000 students. It yeah, was my, until March. Where's, where's, oh yeah, well, <laughs> we're all, we're all on the equal plane. We're, we're in Central Florida. What city is that in? Orlando. Orlando? Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually yeah, it would be considered what East East Orlando. I'm looking uh, at the map behind David so I can orient. Uh, you. Yeah, oh, it's right there, right there. There. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely central. And I, I started as a microbiology major, but ended up getting a degree in political science. Uh, and oh, wow. then I felt like I hadn't fully explored myself and being abroad when I was in Denmark. So I signed up immediately and went to Japan for a few years. Uh, and I was, I was there and then I got, I ended up going to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is a country off the coast of Turkey. It's an embargoed little country. And I was there for three years. Uh, you say, you say, I just went there. I mean, what, what are you throwing a dart at the at a map no, on the no, wall? No. Or, I mean, how do you um, I, mean I, I, I could get into the details. All right. I, I was dating a guy uh, okay. at, at uh -huh. UCF and, uh, came back and we, we decided, you know, this is fun. Why don't we date? some more. This is a couple of years, you know, we'd been apart and he had a friend who came and visited. I didn't have a job yet. I'd only been back about four, four weeks from Japan. And I had come back with a little bit of money and I was still looking and deciding what I wanted to do. And I remember sitting in a, in like a, a bar in Orlando and the guy across the table said, if you come to Cyprus, I'll give you a job. And I said, oh. Well, why not? Everything I own is still in two suitcases. I'll just head over to Cyprus. And so I, I went there and um, That's ended... the, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus for those right. not sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have to, people who are watching, to, trust me, are going to be correcting every little thing like that. Well, and, and it's still called Cyprus, but there's two. So I just I wanted to make sure. I was on the embargoed side. And I will say that we had rolling blackouts in the winter because of electrical outages. And I could go into all sorts of reasons why. In the summer, uh, I would have my water stolen from my roof because people would siphon it off my from, from the water tank off the roof. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, it was uh, not as rough as I just said, but I mean, I, I was there. And while I was there, though, I got to be uh, international marketing coordinator for a university. 
uh, because they wanted an American base. And I, they had a relationship with a Southeastern University out of DC. And so I got an MBA um, while the man that I married, my first husband, uh, he was in the military. So I was by myself because he's from there. And so I said, well, you know, I'm there, so I might as well get another degree. Uh, and then we came <laughs> back to the States. <laughs> I, feel, uh, I feel just lazy listening to you. Uh, <laughs> and then I really slowed down and life just got really slow. And I've been in Florida ever since. But that, that, that was it. That was, um, that's <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> Quite the adventure in your 20s. I know my 20s are. You lived your life, and it is not over yet. Oh my gosh! You just might say the pandemic's over. I'm done. Let's go. <laughs> kind of no. I I, 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 it's it's more impressive than it sounds. But it was the point being for me is that I experienced Japanese culture and religion for several years. I lived in a Muslim country for for several years, and and was able to you know come to terms, I guess, I, I wasn't at odds with myself, but I'm, I'm very clear on, on my perspective on life. But I also realized that I believe everybody kind of wants the same things out of life. We want our kids to be healthy and happy. We want the roads to be, you know, well paved if they can be. We want our trash picked up. We want the police to come when we call, uh, you know, in general, if somebody's breaking yeah. in, you know, things, things like clean that. Clean water, clean water. Right, yeah. right. So um, anyway. That's, that's, I don't remember where we started. I, <laughs> I was asking I'll, about, I'll let David meander. For I was a saying while. about how, you know, people, the more we are exposed to other cultures and other languages, other, other ways of things are being done, especially religions, it opens the door to realizing that maybe that person who feels very passionate about their religion is very different from my religion. So maybe there's something funny going on here. Oh, right, right, right. So the outsider test for faith, right? Like my, my, my religion is, is not true for the same religions. I don't believe their religion. And they, yeah. they believe it so, so, they believe it so strongly, you yeah. know, and it's like, oh, I believe it really strongly. And you're like, well, why, you know, my religion's the one that mm -hmm. is the real religion. Like, no, mine is, mine is. And then you kind of realize they believe in the same way I do for the same reason, which is I was raised in it and that's it. Right. I mean, I have no evidence of anything. It's just, feels like it's right but they also seem to think that it's right too yeah and, and interesting what i what i think is interesting and i've heard this experience from a lot of people and i think we're seeing the secularization of america as a result of kind of apathy and ignorance of religion which is fine with me I, you know i have no problem with that as an atheist but i was raised as a you know non-religious completely secular christian right so we did the we did all of the pagan rituals of easter and, and christmas and pretended like they were they were you know American traditions, right? And, and, and never really talked about Jesus or God. I remember very rarely saying a prayer, never saying a, a grace before a meal that wasn't at somebody else's house, never going to church other than just one summer church camp, which I think was more to get rid of me than it was my interest, you know, and, and, and those things stick out in my mind, but I never really thought about there being a God. I can't remember a time in my life when I thought about there being a God, but my parents would have their entire lives and more so to this day as they're retired and more involved in their church communities had always checked the Christian box if they would have been asked. And, and I don't even know what I would have checked in my 20s and you know, mid 30s is when I discovered skepticism and, and atheism and humanism. So, but it, it's an interesting journey and I think we all bring our own baggage to the conversation and we have to realize that not everybody has had the same experiences with us as us, particularly when you get into diverse groups from yourself. I like how Jocelyn said that the changes are coming with the, with the internet. And I, I do think that's true. I think my eyes have been opened a lot and I was already kind of open, but boy, what a world is out there. I, I, mm -hmm. Well, look, I'm talking to you guys in Florida and this is free. There's, I mean, it's like, hey, here's a link, click on it, let's talk. I mean, it's not like we had to buy a service that was uh, enabling us to have to pay this fortune for the ability right. to do this. It's, I, I, we, I host a trivia night every Thursday night and there's people from, from uh, Canada and there's people from all over the United States and Australia that just, I'm here. And it's like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we take things for granted, like, you know, our, uh, our son has, uh, my stepson, Jocelyn's son has, um, has a phone in his life, and that's all he remembers. And, and he doesn't know a world before apps. You know, he, he doesn't know a world before, you know, Google Street View, right? He, he doesn't know a world before all these things that we, you know, live 
with every day and are such an you know important and sometimes necessary part of our lives. It's it's pretty it's pretty interesting. Uh, it makes me feel old when I think about it. Else. <laughs> my sons are 30 and my youngest one, I, well, he's 29. So I better be accurate. And he said the other day that he was talking to somebody and he said, in my day, and then he stopped and said, oh my gosh, I just, <laughs> in my day. <laughs> wow. Back in my day. Wow. I'm like, uh-huh, you're uh-huh. getting there. My well, favorite thing to say, my favorite thing to say is back in the 1900s because it sounds so fucking old. <laughs> <laughs> in the 1900s i remember when we had to be home to get a telephone yeah. call and you had to fight your brother and your to get to oh, the call before and then you had to you had a long street uh long cord you'd sneak cord. into your bedroom with it and oh my gosh you had to <laughs> a whole different world i didn't hear of atheism until i was 19, 17 and i only the only thing i could do was go to the library to find a book on it i mean you couldn't yeah. there was no there was, was nothing there was no no i can't, uh, I can't imagine because i was raised by an anti-theist my my, my my father would i remember when i was in the fourth grade i brought home a, a friend and we we had only been in omaha for a, a short period of time and i i bring her home after school and we're gonna hang out because that's what you do at that age and my, my dad starts talking to her and he says, so do you go to church? And she's like, yeah, we're a cat. You know, we go to this Catholic church. And then my father launches into talking about the Pope and oh, asking no. about her <laughs> opinion. Greater? Yes. On, on abortion ah. and, and how he, th- you know, and, and I'm thinking, oh man, insert some, some bad words there. I, I really don't understand why you have to do this. So it took, you know, at that point I realized just don't introduce them to my father. He just, <laughs> he's, he's definitely mellowed, but uh, yeah, I was, I was almost hyper aware of, of religion in, the, in that sense. And I, oh, I, wow. I've, I've gone and mellowed as I've, as I've gone through my journey in life. It doesn't work to really just embarrass people about stuff. It's kind of better to just kind of have a conversation with them. I guess we're learning, it takes, we're learning it, best practices as we get older and mellower yeah. in our years, huh? I think all, all the things that we do to, to, to convince people of the rightness or wrongness of a, of a claim, you know, are, are useful, but, and you never know what's going to work on some people. And I think there's, there's some good data out there, but the data is based on, you know, kind of bell curves. And, and there are some people that are on either sides of those bell curves. So whatever method we're using to enlighten one another is, is useful um, in different situations. So, mm-hmm. but, but I think, you know, yeah. our activism in the last few years has really made us more aware of how we are perceived as atheist activists and and uh, social uh, uh, separation of church and state activists and and getting to know uh, Baptist preachers and, and Seventh Day Adventist you know ministers has really helped us understand and it helped them understand as well our perspectives um, and it changes the way I talk and think about things. I was raised Southern Baptist and that was one of the things I do remember is that there was a separation of church and state it was a big deal. One of our our pastor ran for school board or. Uh, so one of the boards in the, in the city and and they made him resign as pastor and I remember oh. that and I think well what was that all about my mom explained well we don't have government in our um in, in there at all and I thought wow okay and, I mean it was one of my first understandings is before I realized I was an atheist but mm-hmm. I I appreciated that you know later in life I thought cool you know, that's yeah. kind of the way we should do it. Not that the Southern Baptists are keeping themselves completely out of religion, but I mean, in politics, but. <laughs> well, and a lot's changed in the last 40 or 50 years in the Baptist church. And, and a yeah. couple of things, people who are who are interested in atheist activism and the philosophy of, of, of thought on this issue and, and the separation of church and state should understand that Baptists, along with Jehovah's Witnesses, have had a history of involvement in the separation of church and state that it really should be understood by people who are interested in the topic of separation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Let's let's talk about uh, free flow because I want to make sure I get through everything. Otherwise, we'll just have a great conversation. So there's a conference every two years, apparently, in southern <laughs> or central Florida. Is it always held in the same city? Um, the last several years. Yeah, it has been. The the Free Thought Florida conference is the uh, used to be the annual conference of the Florida Humanist Association, and I. Um, Due to various things changing, uh, I guess you'd say demographically within the different groups, free thought humanist groups in the state, the the organization got really small. By the time um, I got involved and David got involved, uh, the organization was not as big as it once was. And so we got involved initially to help out with trying to get the conference going. Uh, that was what, 2013, I think? 15, David? Yeah. 14 and 15. Yeah. 
well, 14 and 15, we went, we went to, th anyway, so 14, uh, we get involved, we help out, we realize that we're able to organize it. And in the meantime, there's some political kerfuffles going on the back, back end, and we end up basically getting full throttle involved in the Florida Humanist Association. And it now is only the conference. Um, and so it's, it's due to scheduling. And the fact is, uh, people, this is our opinion, people are not necessarily wanting to go to a conference every year. It's, it's, it's a lot, it's, there's a lot of other conferences to go to. There's all the national conferences. Uh, so we decided to make it biannual uh, every two years, but I think I pronounced that correctly. And it, it allows us, David and I, and, and the other volunteers to kind of get our energy back and, and, you know, get refocused and be able to do a really awesome conference. And what we do with it is all of the money, all of the profit, which we do make money, is able to, to go towards scholarships for Florida university students. And this year we're able to put $4,000, um, which we're right. putting through the Secular Student Alliance, and there'll be $4,000 again next year. Uh, so we, we've worked really hard to make this a, a great regional conference with really, uh, I think a, a broad range of speakers. We work hard to make it entertaining uh, as well as educational because that's important and to keep the costs low. So far, we've been able to keep the conference. If you just want to attend and go to all the talks at about $100, a little less. Which that is really good. I think so for two days. And I, I it's, uh, it's only because of the hard work that we're doing that we're able to do that. And David can give you perhaps a little bit more, but that's. So this is in Orlando also? Yes, yes. We, we, we keep it in Orlando because selfishly, um, I, I'll just say it. I point blank said, if I'm going to be the one, you know, if, if we, David and I, I keep saying I, are the ones doing the work, it's better to do it here because if you're going to go visit the venue, you know, you have to figure out the, all the different things that go with it, the AV, go to the hotel, talk to them about food. I mean, there's all these things that go on in the back end. I, I don't want to drive four hours to get there. It's it, Florida is a long state and there's a lot, the airport's really cheap here. You know, you can get in with flights from everywhere. So it, it works out really well for us. I wouldn't be ashamed at all of saying that I'm keeping it in Orlando. If somebody wants to make a conference somewhere else, more power to them. They can go yes. in the opposite year that you're there and they can have it in Miami or, or the Florida Keys. It's not like, it's not like Orlando is some place out in the boondock somewhere it's a major city with a major airport I, I my son and I flew in there and uh, there was a hurricane going on at the time it was scary I didn't know this weather stuff that you had there it was like all oh, this rain it was very frightening but it's it's a it's a great place to to have a I mean there's there's venues and there's uh hotels and there's you know it's, it should help you keep the cost down a little bit it's a major city so yeah um, the QED conference, the one they have in um, Manchester every year, they have it in Manchester, England every year because they all live there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If somebody wants, wants to organize it, go for it. You can start your own conference somewhere else. I think it's great. So, so you are, this year that we're in right now, 2020, this absolutely horrible, crazy, horrible, horrible year. Back in 2019, did you say, gosh, I can't wait till we're done with 2019 to get into 2020 so we can be over this horribleness? And then here we are into 2020 going, damn, I wish I was back into 2019 when it was, it was a little more naive about how life is. But you, yeah. this year you would have skipped, right? Well, we would have okay. skipped this year anyway. And, and I have to say, um, you know, I'm wondering now, as we sit here and talk about this, are we even going to be able to do this next year? Um, we what we would it be in? It would be uh, end of October. It's usually around Halloween. We take a look at when all of the other national conferences are. We try to be very mindful of not being on the same weekend because we may want the same speakers and things like that. Um, and so that's something that, so it usually turns out to be somewhere between the last week of October to the first or second week of November. Yeah, it's, it generally is, um, we, we, we talk to Barry Carr at CFI, and we talk to the folks of, at FFRF, which we have a good relationship with. And those are the two conferences that it really has a chance of hitting. The Pennsylvania conference, which I don't think happened last year, we, we want to make sure it doesn't. So it's right around Halloween is, is a good way to think of it. We actually had a Halloween party this past year. Um, so, uh, Jocelyn, you were, you were kind of reminiscing about the first conferences in the early days. I mean, we went to the 2012 conference in, in Lakeland right. and tabled there. And then we were at the 2013 conference and involved. And then it was, I think, uh, maybe 14 or 15 when it 
when it uh, kind of was handed over to us to try to organize. And I think another reason that it's in Orlando, uh, in addition to it's easier for us, two more reasons is one is is the, the we're, we're doing a better job each year of getting more help to, 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 to work on this, engaging more people and, and you know, finding people that are interested and passionate and, and they're stepping up and it's been really great. And I think that the more of those people we have, the more likely it'll be in other parts of the state where they live because it is a state, it is a statewide conference. It is a statewide organization. Um, but another reason is, I mean, if we lived in Naples or if we lived in Jacksonville or if we lived in Pensacola, which are the kind of the three corners of this, the state, we would probably be moving it around more because we would be in a far reaching area, but like you said, it's very central here in Orlando. So it makes a lot of sense. And we've had it near the airport the last few years too, because it works really well. I mean, we have about 15 speakers and usually 10 of those are from out of town and out of state. So getting them in and out has been you know, part of the challenge. Now how about how many people attend? What is it, your attendance numbers look like? This year we were, we were sold out um, two weeks before the event at I think 350, give or take, depending on how you count the the, the guests and the comp, you know, guests and stuff like that, that are speakers, et cetera. What were you going to say, Jocelyn? I was going to say another thing which occurred to me as you were speaking is um, UCF, the University of Central Florida, uh, has historically had a really large um, SSA group, Secular Student Alliance group, and they've been a really great volunteer pool. Um, we have a lot of personal friends and and people that we have I, I guess you'd say we've we've because we've been here developing our own smaller organization we've been able to find all of these people who are willing to help us out but the students which we want to attend the conference are here they're in school it's in the school year we're able to get them to come as well and so that's that's another reason why it works really well in Orlando and it's also a good weekend I mean a good uh, cooler weekend for Florida is that right yes I would mm -hmm. never schedule anything in the summer. And I, I think anyone who does, I, I forget. Oh, uh, well, I think it was the World Humanist uh, Congress, or, or Congress yeah. was going to be meeting in Miami uh, in August. And, and oh. they, they we, we, we had our tickets. I mean, it's since been canceled. But I, the first thing I said was it's online. It's online, not canceled. Sorry. Well, all right. Sorry. <laughs> it's not in person. We had our tickets. We were going and I'm like, why would I want to go to Miami the first week in August? It, it, that is the ninth pit of hell. As far as temperature goes, it is so hot anyway. Um, so I, oh, I, would, I don't know that they, I was going to say, I, I don't know that they saved a whole bunch of money on hotel rooms because the price wasn't that, that too, great. Miami. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. I, it's, I, I, I've been to Orlando. We went to my son and I, flew into Orlando and then we rented a car and went over to um, uh, Cape Canaveral and yeah. I loved it. Oh my gosh, what a place to go to. It's beautiful going to see the space center. That's, that's mm -hmm. close enough that you can, you can have a day trip. People can fly in, go, go do something like that for fun. And then I think there's a Disneyland near, near Disney world too. Disney world and universal <laughs> studios yeah, and sea world that. and oh, in the Holy land. I think that's might be closed by now though. Wait, wait, Holy land, the Holy land experience. Yeah. Google yeah. that folks. If you haven't uh, heard of that before, Holy land experience. I haven't heard of that. <laughs> yeah. It was, so Bill, go ahead, Justin. No, I was going to say it's, it's not as nice. And uh, uh, from what I can tell is the creation museum, although I have not <laughs> been to Holy land, I have only driven by, but I, Hey, when David and I first started dating, we did go to the creation museum. David took me, I did not give my money. He used his money, <laughs> but I have been there. <laughs> well, and it's anyway. important to go to those things too, because we need to understand from what I understand, these places are slick. I mean, the oh, creation really museum was, I, 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 my jaw dropped on the floor. It was so well done. Um, you go in in one room and there's a, a three dimensional, um, Lucy, the skull of Lucy, uh, they, they, and you could walk around it and, and they're sitting there explaining why that indicates that we have not evolved from, from Lucy basically. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 yeah, I could go on and on about the creation museum. It would be it just, super convincing if you, if you either already believed it or were looking for information. So, you know, having students group, student groups go there for free and letting people come in and stuff like that. I was so happy that the, the activists there in the, in the Tri-State Freethinkers and the Freedom From Religion Foundation basically said to those folks, you, you can't do that. And, and that kind of activism is really important. And that's the, that's the passionate part of the work we do. And I think that's where we started the conversation was, you know, building a group that could do that kind of activism, so. It's important and you know, the, uh... I just, one of the things our Wikipedia group did was we just wrote the Wikipedia page for We Believe in Dragons, which was a expose, a documentary about the Ark, uh, Ark, uh, in, 
Ark Encounter. Ark yeah. Encounter over in Kentucky. And I think it was really important to understand that, you know, we can laugh and joke that these people think the earth is 6,000 years old and that the Flintstones exist with the dinosaurs. And, you know, we can say, you know, this is just so stupid, but we really do need to know that these people are formidable in a lot of ways. One way is, is they're attracting all these children in because the dinosaurs, I mean, mm -hmm. how cool is that? Absolutely. Isn't that dumb? <laughs> well, you know, what I mean? I, in some I, ways, yeah. they know I, they I, could bring kids in with dinosaurs and, and you've got them. I have a photo of my son on, on the dinosaur at the Creation Museum. <laughs> <laughs> and and I the, the kids area you go in and they you know they have a movie on a loop you go in and you sit and you watch a movie and it's all about King Arthur and the knights and it, it's so much fun and then they explain that King Arthur was actually killing dinosaurs and they were suggesting that dinosaurs were alive during the the knights of the round table sort of time in English history and that, wow. that that's when the dinosaurs were removed uh from the earth really yes and i was like no where have you brought me anyway um, <laughs> but it, yeah it, it's it's very i guess you could say slick david why don't you talk about how uh one of the first things we did was uh for the central florida free thought community was uh orange county uh school public schools they were having a, a bible distribution now orange so county I, is a county in florida because california has an orange county too that's quite conservative yeah so yeah, ours is. I remember reading about this. So go ahead, tell me. Yeah, so Orange County is where the city of Orlando and, and several other cities um, um, are. And uh, so um, I'll give you the short version and then we can drill down um, because I don't want to go too deep. But so in 2013, we were alerted by one of our uh, members of a Bible distribution. Like the next day it was going to happen. And we and FFRF jumped on the stick and got a letter to them saying, hey, we want to participate too. Um, and they said, well, you know, submit your materials and you can do it next time because it was last minute. Um, first of all, we said you shouldn't be doing this because it was a distribution of Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that led to a, a litigation process. But as far as the distribution goes, these churches were coming in and basically putting on tables Bibles. And then they were supposed to leave because it was a passive distribution where they just leave them there and then come back and restock them like you know during class and stuff so people can pick them up like you were to put literature on the counter at the school that was what's supposed to happen in some cases student groups participated in the bible distribution along with those groups and in other cases church members were actually standing there taking photographs and mingling with students handing out bibles and talking about you know the blood of jesus etc i presume because it sounds good to say that way but th that was what was happening. And the reason this happened is because there was a court case down in Southwest Florida where they said, you have to allow, if you're going to have a distribution of anything, you have to have a distribution of everything, right? This is viewpoint discrimination for those watching at home. Viewpoint discrimination is the, is the principle here. So if you're going to allow the United Way and the Boy Scouts and the Red Cross and everybody else to distribute materials in one way or another, you have to allow everybody to do it. And the, and, and the reason for that is you can't discriminate based on viewpoint. So we said, okay, if you're going to do this, we're going to participate. And then they censored uh, Dawkins and Harris um, uh, and Hitchens, and they did allow some of our materials. And then on, on uh, National Day of Reason slash prayer that same year, 2013, we did a distribution with a limited list of materials and then uh, promptly uh, litigated. Um, and the, the school board said, okay, 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 you can distribute whatever you want. Um, and then our friends at the Satanic Temple showed up with this. I great... love them. I love it. <laughs> in comes the Satanic Temple. Like, That's right. right. Uh, aren't they there in... was like a theme music going at the same time. It was amazing. I, um, I love yeah. It's like, so they... okay, fine. You won't let us do it? Hey, <laughs> Satanic Temple, come on over. Yeah. They there had a, go. they had a, they had an answer to the problem. So we're very happy to know <laughs> that there's actually a, a group in Florida or a, a group locally now in central Florida and several kind of subgroups around the state for the Satanic Temple. And we're excited to start working with them. They just started right when COVID hit. So we haven't been able to do much together, but we're staying in touch. But anyway, they came in with this uh, big uh, book of children's activities. Uh, and, and if you haven't heard of that, definitely take a look at that. I think you can buy one for uh, 10 book. or 20 bucks. Yeah, it's, it's an activity book. People call it the coloring book, but it's actually an activity book that basically was about, you know, equality and justice and uh, diversity. And so there was really nothing at all in this activity book that could be that could be booted out, right? There was nothing as offensive as the Old Testament. There was nothing oh, negative wow. about discrimination. There was no blood sacrifice. There was none of that religious stuff. This was a book about the values and tenets of uh, Satanists in the Satanic Temple. And so they were like, shit, I guess, 
I guess we, we can't stop them from distributing this. And the worst thing that happened was one news outlet, a national news outlet, I don't know which one, said, this has been distributed. And that week, a thousand people called the Orange County Public Schools. And this is what I heard come out of the mouth of the uh, superintendent at the, or the uh, chair of the school board at the time. A thousand people called and complained that the Satanic Temple was being allowed to distribute this. Aww. And they did not distribute it. I don't even know if they printed enough to distribute. They just said, hey, we're submitting this so that you can, you know, vet it and then let us know. And guess what happened? They, Everything shut down. Yeah. So it's like, we can't distribute anything. Nobody can distribute any religious materials. And by the way, not being able to distribute religious materials is a form of viewpoint discrimination. So the current status in Orange County Public Schools right now is one that is unconstitutional, which is no religious distributions. But interestingly, Liberty Council, our friends here in Maitland, uh, you might've heard of Matt Staver and Anita Staver. Uh, they, they're, they're one of those Christian ministries that, that go out and fight fights um, to get Christianity you know, propped up in the public square. This is a, a they, law they, group, I believe. It is, it's a law firm, a Christian ministry, a legal ministry. Yep, and they're 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 involved in in this you know current situation when it comes to pastors wanting to wanting to get people sick and and go back to church and not wear masks and not get vaccines. It's really it's interesting the overlap between anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers. Yeah. But um, but they were very aware of the circumstances here, and in my opinion, is they decided not to litigate to allow the distribution of Bibles because they had a case. Because if they would have won, then the Satanists. And the atheists would have also been allowed to do it. And the only reason we were involved was because there was a Bible distribution. Before that, we have no interest in going. I don't have the time or the interest or even the materials to go into schools and distribute stuff to kids, you know, to try to convince them that there's no God. Um, so this was a response by us and a response by the Satanic Temple, and it worked. So it was a it was a great it was a glorious yes. you know effort there, um, a, a teamwork for sure. Let's go to the cruise, and then we can be able to go over to the invocations. Okay. Go ahead, Jocelyn. You want to talk about that? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, it was your br brilliant idea. It was It was my brilliant idea, sort of. Actually, I had never been on a cruise, and uh, David and I were dating, and he said, cruises are fun. We should take one. And I said, well, why don't we invite a bunch of other people to go with us and see who wants to hang out if it's that much fun? It's like a... a you know, a restaurant bar on water, and we don't have to worry about driving home, so let's yeah. do it. And uh, we've done it for six years. We were supposed to go this March. We had 100 people signed up, and uh, it's all nonprofit. We, we buy our tickets. There's no money being made on any of this. It's for the lowest price that you can possibly get the, the passage. And we uh, are able to then use any monies from that to help bring a speaker. So Arn and Lalandra Ra were going to be coming with us this year. Um, we've had uh, Dan Barker and Annie Laurie Gaylor. We've had Hemet Mehta. We've had Daryl Ray. It's it's we've had a really uh, great time with with this, and it's just for fun. You know, we just find basically an inexpensive cruise that we didn't take last year. Um, and we try to at least mix it up every other year on the coasts and go somewhere for fun. Um, and we're probably gonna be moving to every two years, uh, again, for personal reasons, because it's uh, we organize a lot of different things. And I think we've decided that we're gonna probably move to every two years kind of with the conference as well, the Free Thought Florida Conference. That way we have times to do other things in our lives too, <laughs> balance. <laughs> David, do you have anything to add to that? No, I was just it's, thinking so about how this Go ahead. one's canceled. March yes. this year. Yeah. It, probably yeah, right. March next year is probably canceled too. Yeah. I I, I personally am not gonna be and I, I didn't mean to cut you off if you're gonna speak, David, but I, I personally am am not going to be doing anything in public uh, until there is a vaccine. Um, I personally work from home and I don't see any reason to endanger myself. Um, at right. this point so and your family and, right i mean we and have, my family you know, we're yeah, very and, close and to work. even if we have a vaccine it's going to take a while for it to get out into the public and totally yeah. agree yes. i, I have right. anywhere <laughs> that's a good point if you know just because we're vaccinated doesn't mean we can't transmit the virus physically to somewhere else so that's a good point yeah it's best to um, stay it's a few more yeah. months for a lot of sanity let's just hang out i don't know by march i might be just jumping off you know, hanging off the ceiling by then. Right now, I'm able to say it's okay. It's only been what since April, no March, March 14th for me. I think yeah, I'm naturally pretty introverted. 
I, I've, I've gotten to be uh, over the past six, seven years, you know, much more comfortable with going out and, you know, three or four nights a week doing uh, Central Florida Free Thought community stuff. But I actually have enjoyed being at home. I'll be one of those people. I'll say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff around the house and reading books and, and I've done all the typical baking things and... <laughs> You know, hey, it, I, I'm embracing the time while I have it. It, it probably won't be forever. So I, that's kind of my perspective. Yeah, we're trying to get stuff done here too. But I tell you, if I had didn't have Zoom or some kind of some kind of outlet, I would be losing it because I am definitely not an introvert. <laughs> it's yeah. really hard for me. So we we thought, you know, we thought that this would be a great way to stay connected. Um, and you know, when the weekend we were supposed to leave on the cruise was the last weekend I had a haircut, and uh, we went back in March. That. <laughs> and uh, I, I get it wet and tucked it in. It's all back here. But, <laughs> but we, you know, we, we were we were talking about how to stay engaged. And, and we came up with this brilliant idea that everybody else did that same weekend, which was, you know, let's get on Zoom and let's get an account and let's start bringing folks in like you and, and Benjamin Radford and Catherine Stewart and Lucian Greaves, Doug Mesner from the Satanic Temple. We've had some great conversations and, you know, put those up on on YouTube uh, mm -hmm. and really enjoyed getting to know folks that we couldn't afford to fly to Florida. And before that, before that, you know, if you were to say, hey, everybody, come to the event this month, we're going to have uh, Susan Gerbic on Zoom, right? Come watch her on a screen in the front of the room. It'd be, it's crazy, right? It's like nobody's going to come to that, you know, but now it's like, oh, my God, Susan's here. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 because you're as here as you're going to get right now. It's, it's you know? so much fun to be able to connect with people, like I said, over the internet in ways. That, and then we could put it up on YouTube for anybody who missed it or has a conflict of some sort or time zone problem. Mm -hmm. I, I should tell you that, okay, you guys out there watching, I did do a talk for, for you two uh, last Sunday. It's been, yeah, Sunday. It's like forever I ago. Nothing anymore. I don't know. It's <laughs> July right. now, right? So it was, it was in June. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and um immediately i got um an editor and she is a nikki and she is already partially she's like a third of the way through the training since sunday and then i have That's two great. other people who are taking the um pre-training for me and so we'll see if they end up staying and working out but nikki's already you know she contacts me probably every day and asks me a question about something and she's learning awesome. really fast she's she's moving right along and i'm like this is great you know because I don't get a lot of chance to speak to humanist groups. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things we have found in the skeptic world, because you know we're, we have a lot of overlap, but then there's, there's this kind of Venn diagram where there's some areas, the atheist humanist groups. We mm -hmm. found that when I'm speaking to an atheist or a humanist group, most of the time they don't know who I am. They're hearing about it for the very first time and they're like, oh, wait, what? Oh, edited Wikipedia? But the skeptic world knows who I am because I'm on podcasts and articles and skeptic inquire and stuff all the time. So those people, when I speak to them, they're like, oh, my God, I've heard Susan so many times. I might as well just go ahead and join this project. It's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> but the free thought group, they ask questions. And it's funny when you do the Q&A. And most times they're asking these questions that are just like, but I thought anybody could edit Wikipedia and it's just going to be taken down. And you're like, <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> Not if you do it right. Yeah. It's it's a two, yeah, if you do it right. But it's it's a different world of um I'm not in this the humanist and the atheist world so much. I'm not a, a mm -hmm. people go, who's that? But and it's really nice to see you had Ben Radford over there because he's like Mr. Skeptic in cryptozoology and amazing stuff and totally love yeah. him. Um Catherine Stewart, she came out to uh, California on a book tour when her book came out and she came down and she came and gave a talk to my group and we've never done a talk before, a live talk, but she was coming through. So we, we rented a place and she gave us a little talk and it was nice. I think Great. we just wrote her, um, her books, the book that she wrote, The Good News Club. Yeah, the good news. The, the first one. This that's, next that's one. That's a really interesting story. Yeah. yeah. She, she's, she's an interesting boy. I can't imagine the hate and the just to be involved in that for so long to oh it's just what an ugly the it things is. they do to those kids in these these camps and stuff and the you know hell and high and hellfire and you're going to hell and you're going to burn in eternity forever i can't even yeah wow her, that was her first book which was very well received by us and very badly received by them 
Um, yeah. And yeah. and so the, the recent book was called The Power Worshippers, uh, Inside the Dangerous Rise of the Religious Right, where she talks about Christian nationalism. And that was her more recent book from 2020. But, but yeah, the Good News Club had a big splash and she had a great time touring for a couple of years. And we got to know her back in 2013. And she actually put uh, in the book, and I did want to mention, um, we have a board of directors here. One of those directors is uh, Joseph Richardson. He was actually featured in one of the chapters there because of the activism that he was engaged in in Central Florida. So we've had the privilege of knowing Catherine for, for quite a while and, and, and very happy to, to be able to consider her a friend of the organization. But um, so yeah, so we've got a, a board of directors of six people who uh, mm -hmm. um, are um, very helpful in keeping the organization going and, uh, and, and a lot of event hosts and a lot of people that are trying to make things work. And I just wanted to mention real briefly that when we shifted from the, you know, um, before the COVID era to the COVID era, um, we went from, you know, having all those events in person, we just basically moved them online. I think a lot of folks are doing that and, and we were uh, happy to be able to do that. We've seen a, a, a little bit of a waning uh, you know, you can see the people that want to talk online or the ones that are still there and the ones that didn't dig on it, you know, kind of moved on. But we're hoping to keep the group connected as best we can because we're going to have an after, you know, it's going to be yeah, soon. Hopefully. I hope so. And the it's women. keeping connected. And also you're introducing yourselves to a whole world. I mean, when you brought me in and you bring in Ben Radford, who are from the skeptic community, that's a whole world of people who are going, oh, what's this humanist uh, mm -hmm. free thought group in Florida? I, I'd never heard of it. You know, that's that's the mm -hmm. mentality. And same, you know, I, I've been in talks all over the world and um, I just did Sydney, Australia the other morning, two in the morning. Wow. <laughs> that was fun. But, um, but the idea is, is that you get interested in these groups all over the world. It's only going to help when we finally get to the conference stage, when we can finally go out and meet, people are mm. going to say, I have family in Florida, or I have, I have to go to, I have a conference. I have to go work in Florida for, uh, you know, I got to be there for something. I wonder what else is happening in Florida while I'm there. They're going to be aware that there is a group and they may yeah. show up at your meetings. They may show up for a conference. They may plan things so that they're able to come in and, and, and uh, you know, they already understand. And I think that's where, you know, we, if we take advantage of that, I think it's going to help a lot because people will say, oh, you know, mm -hmm. I have to go to work in um uh, Belgium and there's a group in Belgium so they can go and yeah you know go and show up and have go to a skeptics in the pub or something go to an event and have have some people to talk to maybe go tour the city with them or something I mean people in our community are really welcoming and wonderful people we we enjoy meeting each other at least we I I, I I will say that I mean we've taken so we we were having meetings in a, you know our local areas Orlando and Winter Park and, and all these different towns and they've moved online but the women's group which is something I started a couple years ago I was running a book club once a month oh, we'd really read. Uh -huh. yeah yeah we you know the, the group we get together we'd meet at a coffee shop we'd talk about a book and I, and I will say that when you run a book club, it gets a little tiresome after about two years. And, and I'm the only one that really completes the book every month. And I have to have all, you know, and I was getting burned out. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I can't do this anymore. And then somebody said, well, why don't you just make it a woman's group? And I said, a woman's group, why do, why do we need one of these? Um, and, and she said, well, I just left the church six months ago and I was going three days a week and I'd really like to have a, a, an opportunity to be able to talk to people and get things off my chest and not in necessarily in a book. Interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I said, well, I was a little skeptical and I, I, I said, okay, sure, let's try it. I'll go to the library, I'll set up a time, we'll sit around in a circle, see what happens. And uh, you know, initially 15, 20 people showed up and the women's group has become uh, the strongest in some ways group. I mean, we're meeting every week um, online. The Zoom has been, been very useful. There have been offshoots. So we had a, a cooking thing where everybody had to have cameras and we all cooked and we were sharing what we did over a two hour period. And it was like, yeah, I forget what it's called. There's like a competition. There's a whole Netflix series. And that was fun. And so we're doing all sorts of different things to kind of keep ourselves connected and entertained and engaged. But this group of, of people, they've been our great, the best volunteers ever. So from a group organization perspective, if somebody in your group says, let's do something, I always say, give them the opportunity. You guys go do it, see how it goes or do it yourself. I, and I, I, it's been wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful. I've made incredible friends and mm -hmm. they've been a, the real backbone of a lot of our activities. So 
Well, they say that people stay, uh, one of the main reasons to stay into the church after you've started questioning your beliefs is because of the community. You don't right. want to lose it. Well, you don't want to possibly with your family and, and other problems that are going to occur, but having, you know, having a, a, an automatic group to go to, to be able to say, we understand, let's hang out. You know, you, yeah. you need to find new friends and you need to find yeah. new, new people to hang out with. So I, I totally agree. I think that's a wonderful thing. I know that we're getting um, at, over Zoom. I think that people are starting to know each other in better ways. They're, they're connecting with each other. You know, I have these trivia things and I, I randomly put them into a trivia team. So there's five of them on a team. They're, they're meeting people from all over that, that are from all aspects of, of the, my world. And it's fantastic because mm -hmm. they get to know them and it's just going to make it so much more enriching. Yeah. Yeah. We've I done trivia so. for a couple of months now. One of the, one of the people that participates in the women's group has, has hosted trivia for us and zoom is a great way to do that. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. And yeah. I forgot what I was going to say, but I'm sure we'll come back to it. <laughs> I, I, I think the most important thing is, which is what I, I say to people when they're joining us, is that unless we spend time together, unless we get to know each other, you're not going to feel comfortable calling me if your car breaks down on the side of the road. You're not going to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to know that you've gotten sick and you need something dropped off. We have to spend time together. Mm -hmm. We have to do stuff together. We have to build this community because uh, we are, I, at least for me, you know, I moved a lot in my life. I don't have people I went to school with that, that I'm still friends with, really. I have a few people I know, but they don't live locally. So it, the point is, is that we have to spend time with people if, if we want to have those type of relationships and that type of support system. And I, and I, I, I that's Absolutely. why we do what we do. And they'll donate for activism. Side effect you know, maybe 2% of our group really want to go out and volunteer for activism, but the other people will donate, you know, they'll, they'll help make it happen, which is really important. And I'm going to force this into a segue and let's talk about invocations. And 20 I, yeah, please, David, yeah. I'm going to hand that over to you. I'll talk about what we've done locally, but you talk about Brevard. Yeah, sure. Sure. I, I, let me just say what I was going to say a moment ago, which is very brief is that, you know, churches, synagogues and mosques invented relatively nothing other than theology, the community, the volunteerism, the, the, the advocacy and the activism of and social justice, I, all these things are secular, mm -hmm. right? Everything about a church and the community that you build is secular. It's only the theology that church came up with. So people that are averse to meeting on Sunday afternoons or Sunday mornings because it's too churchy, got to get over that, right? <laughs> the church stole Sunday from everybody else, right? We then before that, they stole Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I want my Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so invocations. So uh, l let me just tell a brief story, and we'll come back to a couple of Explain highlights. Explain what so, it is. Explain yeah. what it is. Yeah. So you know, when w an invocation is typically invoking a deity or a god, and uh, invocation is is commonly the term commonly used to describe a prayer before a government meeting, a legislative prayer. Uh, is typically an invocation. Sometimes it's a moment of silence. Sometimes it's a secular reflection. Lots of ways to describe it. Invocation is the most commonly used term. Um, and we just, you know, we don't invoke anything higher. We invoke one another. We invoke the staff and the volunteers and the community to be a part of the event, whatever that invocation is, is about, whether that's um, before a conference or before a meeting or before a ceremony. An invocation typically is a religious prayer, but for us, it's really just calling on, you know, um, the better parts of who we are and the, the community and the, and the, and the, you know, the, the higher power in some cases, and Dan Barker talks about this, is we the people, right? All of us together are, are a higher power than one of us individually. So you know, let me segue into what we've done with that. So we basically have delivered 90 invocations uh, as an organization in the last uh, five and a half years, maybe six and a half years. Got to do some math here real quick. 2014. But, yeah, back in, yeah. in May you of 2014. You ought to talk about Greece v. Galloway, maybe. Yeah, so, so the, you know, even before that, the, there was a decision from the Supreme Court, Supreme Court called Marsh v. Chambers, where Ernie Chambers, who is actually still, I think, maybe serving or just finished serving in the Nebraska House, um, uh, he basically sued and said, we can't pay a chaplain to you know, pray for us as, you know, as an organization in the, in the, in the House of Representatives. And he's been in service for that long back in 83. And they said, okay, yeah, you're, you're right. But um, it, it can happen if it's a neutral prayer, if it's a non-sectarian prayer, 
Um, and this was at the state house, right? This was not at local meetings. Fast this forward. Nebraska. Yeah, Nebraska. Yep. Um, fast forward to 2009. I mean, and many of us were going, why are all these prayers happening? Didn't we decide this wasn't okay? If you're going to pray, it has to be a generic prayer, you know, not to Jesus or, or, or Allah. Um, and, and they sued in the town of Greece, New York. Um, uh, the names are escaping me in just a moment, but uh, um, Greece versus Galloway because the town of Greece and I think Susan Galloway, and I can't remember the other lady's name, if one of you could look that up. Uh, the two plaintiffs in that case basically said, you know, you're having invocations in violation of the current status of the law. You're praying in Jesus name. Um, you're actually facing the audience. You're doing many things that are not appropriate and certainly very different than a, a legislative prayer, which is one that happens you know, on the floor of the legislature to the legislature where the public is kind of up in this up in the, the galley and not or the gallery and not really, you know, part of the event, but in this in this city and town council and commission section or setting, we're all there to participate. I'm coming to get my pothole fixed. You're coming to, to talk about, you know, the next zoning um, uh, issue that's coming up. Someone else is doing an application for whatever, you know, we're part of this meeting. And now you're saying we got to stand up and pray before this, because let me tell you what, if I'm getting advice from somebody and I'm going to that meeting to ask for something, if I ask an attorney or anybody else who understands the process, you know what they're going to tell me to do when there's a prayer right before I, I ask for something? They're going to say, get up and pretend like you're praying with them because it, you need to look like you support what everybody else supports. The last thing you want to do is sit through the, pre, the Pledge of Allegiance, right, the prayer to the flag, and then sit through the prayer to God and then go up and say, hey, nice to see you all today. Uh, can you fix my pothole? Why would I do that? You just sat through the, the prayer to the flag and the prayer to my God. So this test, this, this religious test is something that is abhorrent, but it happens all over the place, hundreds of times a day across the country in cities and towns and counties. And so the, 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 the Greece decision said, okay, this is fine. And this was a totally a loss, right? We've made, we've made kind of lemonade out of this situation, but they said, you can actually have an invocation and you can pray in Jesus' name. You just can't, uh, which was from the Marsh decision, you can't denigrate non-believers. You can't um, proselytize. You can't do these things in a way that actually makes it look like you're privileging religion and Christianity and denigrating all these other organizations. And by the way, even an atheist should be able to give an invocation because they would have allowed that apparently in the town of Greece. And those are the words from the actual decision in 2014, the Greece versus Galloway decision. Just before this decision came out, we, we expected it. Uh, I obtained my uh, ordination from the Humanist Society as a celebrant, just in case they said in that court, uh, in that decision, that you have to be clergy. I was ready to go. We did all the research and we had 20 local towns and counties here in Central Florida. And once the decision came out on that Monday, by that Friday, we had sent all these letters out and said, hey, we need to do invocations now because this is, you know, we're looking for our opportunity that you're giving everyone else. So we sent out 20 letters, give or take, and um, most of them within a year allowed us to participate. A couple didn't, a couple were a little bit obstinate and I will name names, uh, the city of Apopka, the city of Sanford and the city of Deland either delayed, uh, stymied uh, or really made it hard for us to participate. But one in particular, the county of Brevard, the Space Coast, which is relatively conservative considering they you know, got a lot of astronauts over there, um, or at least had, um, they were very, uh, very much against this. In fact, in their depositions, they demonstrated animus towards pretty much anything except monotheism. Wow. Yeah. So, so you know, that's kind of the background on it. And if you had questions about the background, then we can jump into the kind of the case if you want. Well, I, I think the invocations, you know, people say, well, what's the, what's the point? Let them pray. You know, to me, I, for some reason, this feeling I have, I've had this, this thing since I've been a little girl, I've hated clicks, you know, the feeling that you belong, but you don't. And this is for you, but not for you. And you can come to my party, but you can't, you know, that kind of idea of clicks mm -hmm. I hated it all my life. You know, I was always the person on the outside of the click always, but when you get a chance and you can have a click, you know, you, you get a group of people. I hated the way it felt. I hated the feeling of excluding anybody and darn it. If, if invocations have always felt like that to me, it's, this is my government too. This mm -hmm. is my government around me. I'm paying my taxes. I'm a citizen and so on. I darn well want to be able to go to a city board meeting or whatever and not have to feel like I'm ostracized or I don't belong to the right group or the right clique. You represent me. 
And so this has always been a hot button issue for me. I am like, it just makes me want to, you know, it's one of those topics that whenever you, how do you say it, whenever you're, whenever you're uh, talking about um, uh, the things that you cannot, you cannot uh, sit still and be quiet about. Mm -hmm. that's my hot button one of my hot button ones it's like, we can yeah. talk about a lot of things and i'll be like mm -hmm, okay <laughs> but when you talk about you are even allowed to pray mm -hmm. and and i have to sit and listen and i have to nod my head no yeah uh, that makes me yeah. so angry we've it's... we've been really um we've worked really hard to make our invocations as welcoming as possible. And that's been a transition. And I, I think when you look at what people were saying back in 2014 and 2015, you see a lot of invocations. And even today, some in some other areas, sorry if my breath is in there, um, <laughs> you're going to see that invocations in some ways might have appeared to be anti-theistic and hostile in in a way and uh and if anybody's interested i i did put the link there um, i saw the i the saw chat. the the last one you read i said this is beautiful this is actually just thank you i, I think we, it's I, just a wonderful little thing like hey let's all really I've focus actually, on what we're here at hand it's really i can't see how anybody would say that's not okay that's just like it's been wonderful for us, and I would encourage anyone who has a local group to consider getting involved with invocations, and this is why, in part, is because, one, we've met new people. So I've walked out of invocations. Uh, in one city, I had the, the city lawyer come up to me afterwards uh, because we walk out right right after the pledge. Typically, we're, we're, we're all walking out. He followed us out and said, thank you so much. This is the first time I've ever heard an invocation where I felt good. He, he was, uh, oh, he, he identifies as Jewish. Uh, oh, I remember, yeah. I remember going into a, into a, a city and we were talking about they were talking about going to a moment of silence and I was there to speak on it. Another board member was speaking on yes, or moment of silence. It's awesome. Let's do it. You know, we, we used our two, two, three minutes, actually a young, a young Christian guy got up. He spoke for three minutes. He said, I also think a moment of silence, but then every board member down the line got up and talked about their God. But finally the last one got up and she was, uh, an older woman who identified as Jewish. And she said, I've been on the board for over eight years now, and I've never once been represented. And she proceeded to go on for 15 Ooh. minutes talking Ooh. about how uncomfortable she has been. And in the end, they voted to keep invocations, but open the policy. And I went in and I we've been in there a couple times a year. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, another side note, and I tend to jump around, uh, David's very good at staying focused, I jump. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, just who I am. Uh, if you're ever getting involved with invocations and if you ever want any help on, on, on how to approach it, please feel free to contact me. Always treat city employees really well. Be really nice. They're doing their jobs. You know, whether you don't know what they believe, what they don't believe in. And so I've worked really hard to be super nice to the people we work with. And as a result, they call me and, or they email me and they'll say, hey, can you come in and give an invocation? Wow. And the fact, the fact Tomorrow. that- Tomorrow. <laughs> right tomorrow because so and so can't come right but the point is is if we were a jerk about it if we went in and said you guys suck then they wouldn't be having us come back and every time i've gone in there and given an invocation i think about her i think about how she feels and how i can give a message that will help everybody in the room feel like they're there to start a meeting and i'm not the type of again like i said I, i'm kind of introverted this isn't really I, I don't really feel that personal need but i realize this is like a team it's a team sport you go into a, a government meeting we're all there to do the same thing we want the city to go well we want the county to to thrive we want good things to happen so let's just all turn our phones off and get to the job at hand and i I think invocations can really do great work. Um, and you can find new members. We found new members from people in the audience who heard us, followed really? us out afterwards. We gave them our card, they found us, and now they come to our meetings. And we make them social. Another side note is every time we have an invocation, we either have, if it's a morning meeting, then we'll have breakfast beforehand. If it's an afternoon meeting, we go to coffee or beer afterwards. If it's an evening meeting, we go to dinner afterwards. So you go do a little activism for 15 minutes because it's super quick, and then we go out. And so it's win-win, you know? Yeah. And we've, we've and, and another thing I wanna brag about, 
we so at first it was David and myself and other board members giving the invocations and then we realized why do you have to be one of us why can't somebody who lives in the city do it right so now we've got our members giving the invocations um you know, we, we offer to write them for them if they want. So I can say this person lives in, in this town, lives in Winter Park, gave the invocation. They can personalize it. It makes it so much better. So it's we've it's had, it's really yeah, I was great. Gonna say, we've had 37 invocators. I just looked at the list, 37 wow. different invocators and only a handful wow. of those are, are, are clergy members. Right. And by clergy members, I mean, you know, humanist celebrants and, and, and chaplains. So, you know, yeah, we, we're not offended by prayers. As atheists, I think some people assume that, and, and maybe some people are. Prayer doesn't offend me because I find it just, you know, kind of passively just a, a, annoying, not necessarily offensive. What's offensive is when a government presumes that everybody comes there to hear a prayer, or that or everybody that feels you included. All you're all, yeah. like, you're all Christians. That's right. Right. There's this, there's this really assumption that we all that we all worship the same God, regardless of our faith. Right. God. That's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it's just, it's annoying that way. But Jocelyn, you mentioned the link and, and, and there's nobody on this uh, um, right now in the Zoom, but there are people on YouTube and, and perhaps yeah, and Facebook. I see people on Facebook who are, yeah, it's not on YouTube. It's, it'll yep. be put on YouTube later, but we'll put the links in the YouTube. Yeah. I, I'm, I see them up here on the Facebook and um, Robin Canton, who's in Canada and said that they got rid of invocations a couple of years ago in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was saying that it looks like I guess he was looking at your link that you put up, David, and he was saying, yep. well, you guys are really on a roll before COVID hit. Yeah, we have the, a good year for you. The website is uh, cflfreethought.org slash invocations. And you can see we're cataloging all of them that we know about, including the 90 or so that we've done. And you can find video where, at, where it's available, audio where it's available, uh, the text of the invocation, and, and oftentimes the, uh, the duration and the word count so that you can actually know how long these things are and you can find something you like there. And, and please plagiarize those. Um, you know, we don't want people to start invocation practices, but if there's an invocation practice in your area, you know, you can add to the mix of people by doing a secular invocation. And, you know, if you Google satanic invocation, you'll have a bit of a thrill too. Yeah, so, that's... So talk about the satanic invocation, the whole thing with David Souter. I mean, you guys are so <laughs> sweet and so nice. And you're saying, let's be really, you know, not so... I don't know, Jocelyn, if you'd say you're not in their face so much, but David I, I'm not. is like the opposite. Right. Yeah. I, I, he and have I, to be? Is that like because I, he had to be, not because he it, wanted it, to be? It's a choice. I mean, I, I, I think there's a different approach and I, I'm not going to argue that either one's better. Obviously, I, I, I personally have thought about this when we first started and what am I personally comfortable with and where do I want to be when I walk in the room? Um, I, it, it doesn't make me comfortable to have that kind of uh, confrontation. The idea behind it, and, and David, you, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, I, I, is that I, I think the Satanic Temple's approach and, and other groups have been, if it's strong enough, it may actually close the forum. Um, and that's, that's the idea, is that you're really pushing the envelope and you're demonstrating perhaps the absurdity of some of the previous prayers that have been given and things like that. I, I'm not good at that. That's not who I am. Me either. <laughs> and so I, I also think that, that in the end, and, and I'm kind of segueing into interfaith work, the, the more we do it, the more we present a, a, sec, a secular message, in my opinion, the more likely that the entire conversation, all of the future invocations have the potential to move to that more middle ground because they recognize the viability of it. Um, I don't know, and I don't, I personally don't believe that the invocations are going to just suddenly go away. They might in a couple little towns here and there, but I don't see them disappearing. And so I would prefer to move them more to a, a secular message of, of inclusivity uh, as opposed to attempting to close it. But that's, that's my perspective. Oh. The, the, I wouldn't want to speak, um, you know, on behalf of the Satanic Temple or any of their members for sure. Um, but I will say there's differently different perspectives. And Hemet Meta and I talked about this on an interview several years ago. Is you know there's a lot of approaches to take, and if you want to stereotype it, you can say there's the atheist approach, there's the humanist approach, there's the Satanist approach. You can do that, and you can generalize in, in that way. And I'll and I'll let people chew on that. But I will say this: the Satanic Temple, in in my opinion, is simply going in and doing what they feel on their hearts. Uh, and in their minds, and that they're passionate about, and that simply is offensive because of sometimes what they look like, but not always. 
sometimes the, the word Satan or satanic is a problem. In fact, that's the biggest problem. But when you listen to what they're saying, even David Suhor's chant, right? And, and I don't mean to demean what he did by calling it a chant, but he basically sang an invocation. It's and beautiful. the words of it What's and his singing, he's a, he's a, he's a musician, were, were fantastic. But the fact that he was in a black hood and was part of the satanic temple at the time made it so offensive that Jesus was crying. You know, it, it just, it, it was, it was amazing though. And, and I actually got to see him do that at the Freedom From Religion Foundation convention that same year, he won the Nothing Fails Like Prayer Award. And uh, I mean, it was, it was perfect, nothing offensive about it, except for the connotation that Christianity has placed on this character called Satan. That's it. It was fascinating. I, when I wrote the Wikipedia page, I had to watch a lot of these videos that David Sewer, Sewer is doing. And for people not listening, not knowing who we're talking about, this is an activist in uh, the Pensacola area, Pensacola area, Florida. And they had a lot of these board meetings. The ones that really pissed me off were the school board meetings because yeah. there's kids there, you know. And so they, 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 they insisted on having these prayers. Uh, that were Christian, maybe if you're lucky, there would be one that was maybe from a, uh, 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 rabbi, maybe mm -hmm. something other than Christian, <laughs> Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. something other than Christian once in a great while. And what they would do is they would, so, so he was trying to get in and do the invocation. I assume he would have been just fine if they'd said, sure, go ahead and do a, a secular. Cause he started out secular and then went into the satanic thing a little later. But if they, if they had said, sure, come on in and do a secular thing, I'm sure he probably would have just done it. But the guy's a performance, he made it into performance art where he would go in one time in a completely black hood with the big over the brim kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was, he, 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 well, like you said, he'd sang it and he chanted, it was gorgeous, but it still was scary as heck to people. Another time he pulled out a prayer mat and he and he like was on the prayer mat the whole time that the whole the whole meeting was going on. He just laid there. They had to have him taken out at some point. His point, I assume, from what I've learned, is I'm going to make it as uncomfortable for you, the Christians in the audience, that you have made it for the non Christians in the audience. And a little dose of that isn't going to hurt you. But boy, it raised just the. Yeah. It was like a madhouse in there. People were screaming at each other and, and how dare you? And he's like, um, you know, and they're just screaming at each other and just so <laughs> mad. Was, if, if you can watch some of these videos, they are so yeah. uncomfortable. His I, descent is patriotic. For I sure. could not do it. No it's way. really useful though. I mean, I, I, and I, I hope I didn't come That's across like, I, it, yeah, I, I think what he's doing is really useful. I, I think that having people that are willing to push that envelope is really useful. Um, because also it makes, makes our invocation seem so <laughs> tame in perspective. They're like, whoa, it could be There's like no that. Problem. But, but, but you right. could sing, you could sing ours in a black you cloak would, would and it would be scary. Sing. He actually is a singer. He actually yeah. can sing. I, I, yeah. you, it, I would scare the room for a different reason. If I tried to sing. <laughs> so, so that, let's talk a little bit about the lawsuit just to close that gap, because I think yeah, if yeah. we leave that open, people are going to be disappointed. So let me, let me just wrap it up. Yeah. So basically in May of 2014, we sent the, our first letter to the Brevard County, uh, Board of County 14? Commissioners. 2014? Yeah. Really? May 2014. Yeah. It was back in, in, um, in the early May or mid May, early May when the, the, the Supreme Court came down with the Greece decision. And we sent letters out to 1920 at the time. And then in August, um, the board voted, Actually, I think we sent two letters. In August, the board, the board realized we were serious and actually had a vote, and they voted five to zero to reject our request to, to conduct an invocation. Um, you know, and then uh, Americans United um, and ACLU of Florida, Anti-Defamation League, uh, American Humanist Association, and uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation were all engaged in this process in varying ways uh, along the way. In July 2015, we had sent a letter with the help of the, the lead counsel on this, which is Alex Luchinitzer at Americans United. He, uh, you know, penned a letter with the help from the other attorneys. There was several on the on the case. Uh, in July 2015, the the board had said, "Here is our proposed invocation policy," and it was, uh, I like to say, 66.6 .6 pages of of <laughs> basically, here is why atheists and humanists should not be allowed to do invocations. And it was very um, offensive. Yeah, it's 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 still it's still out there. I think as a as a uh, uh, I don't remember the number, but it was on July seventh, twenty fifteen, and they basically said, "Here's why you don't get to do it because 
this humanist in the past said this thing that I don't like, and this atheist in the past said this thing I don't like. So therefore, all of you think and act like that and shouldn't be involved. Um, and by the way, you know, we want to make sure we honor um, our community and we believe in God kind of stuff. So it was it was literally 66 pages uh, or so. I think I've just rounded it off in my memory. Um, <laughs> but then we basically filed the lawsuit immediately after they passed that invocation policy on July 7th, 2015. Um, in 2016, in September, we had our hearing in the uh, Middle District Court in Orlando. And then in October 2017, like forever later, we won at the district court. And then uh, in December, Brevard appealed that ruling to the to a three-judge panel at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And then in February 2019, that was heard by that um, that judge or those judges. The three. Um, the three judges, yep. And then in July 2019, we had our victory. And basically, we, we said, uh, you cannot discriminate against us because of who we are and who we're not. Uh, and the court agreed with us at the district court and at the circuit court. And Brevard voted uh, not to uh, not to appeal. And, and that was in February of this year. So basically, in the 11th Circuit, uh, you cannot have a policy and a practice that discriminates against non-theists. And, you know, cases like David and in other parts of the state where there are invocations right now that are either done by commissioners or fire chaplains or police chaplains uh, or, or aren't being properly handled, um, you know, the right exists for us to go in there and, and demand our opportunities to do it. But unfortunately, not all of those can be litigated. The 11th Circuit has changed, as most circuits have in the last several years. The conditions in every situation are different. Um, so, you know, we don't unfortunately have a victory you know, for, for David and his work up in uh, Pensacola and in other parts of the state. And we're seeing still invocation problems going on uh, around the state, including at school boards, which should not be praying at all. Mm -hmm. But we can't litigate every one of them and letters don't always work. So we just, we have to do the best we can. And I think honestly, um, turning the world secular, turning the electorate secular and turning the candidate secular is the long-term solution along with all the other tools that we have. So I have a question. I wanted to know how much was it that uh, this ended up costing the uh, the county? Uh, how much taxpayer money do you think came out to, to litigate this? You know, I, I, I know that they ended up paying about a uh, half a million dollars to uh, Americans United and only a small part of that went to the plaintiffs. Uh, and, and that, you know, that was part of the original negotiation that we had with, with, with the county uh, on that front. And that, you know, that money is based on the, the publicity that we lost uh, in the process of being denied those applications. So the city, the county paid about $450,000, $500,000 in total. And I think all but, a, all but a small portion of that came from insurance. So we all get to pay for it because the insurance companies are just gonna charge us more. And they, and they just think that they're right and we don't wanna, I, 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 I assume that what's going on in a lot of these, these areas is that people are feeling challenged. I mean, they've had the Christianity has been the major religion all the time. They've always they've been in power. Mm -hmm. They are not used to being challenged. Some people really do believe this idea that America is a Christian nation, and that's the end of that. You know that the Constitution says that or something, and we should just abide by it. And or majority rules, which is really hilarious because I keep thinking, well, so if we vote that all redheads are now slaves, is that okay? Because mm -hmm. the majority rules. You know, I mean, it's that idea. But I think that what's happening is this pushback, and maybe this is why we have the Trump administration and that is that people are feeling more encroached on all these things they thought they were in charge. I we're the we're the number one, we're we're number one, and now we're we're marginalized and it's getting smaller, and they're really uncomfortable with that. And I, I guess I could understand why you'd feel uncomfortable that you're being marginalized and told you can't do that anymore. But, but not, but not. No. So we got to put this in the right perspective and forgive me for pushing back so vigorously, but oh, that's fine. they are not being marginalized. Well, Their they, privilege is being challenged. Well, that's they I mean. are being, yeah, they, I, I understand. And what, mind, what we have to do is we have to keep in mind that, that they are basically uh, uh, afraid of dying as a tradition, as a faith, as a patriotism, all these things uh, as a color, as a skin color, right? But, People but, are afraid but, of these things. David, I, I think you have to also think about where are they getting their information from. Um, sure. And 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 I I personally think Fox News is is a bigger problem 
than than many other things. I, and I, I think that they are getting their worldview from that source. And as a result, they don't know that they are not being put upon. Does that make sense? They yeah, they're they, told they, their privilege is right. ab appropriate. Yeah. And and so I, you know, it's a matter of how you want to frame it. But I, I think it's fear. I, I, oh, yeah. I think they're, I, I think they're yeah. scared. Well, my, fear. Child, my grandchild might marry somebody of another religion or something. But also, have babies that are not white. You know, I don't yeah. know. And they're this told every day. Well, so here's the thing. I mean, the fear in the eyes of the two attorneys with the acre-sized, you know, dining room the other day in what is it, St. Louis, who had brown and black people walking down the street in front of their house. That's the fear. Oh, that's yes, the yes, that's yes. the fear oh, they're feeling, God. and it is completely unjustified. Now, I get it. I get that they have never had people of color walking down their street before, and I get how that might make them feel. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the reality that we live in. People of color protesting, asking for their rights. And I'm sure they weren't all black and brown people out there. There were all kinds of people out there, but they were so scared because they never had anybody on their damn street before because the gates are normally locked and the police are running around trying to keep you know the people of color out of there. That's the unreasonable fear that made them grab a handgun and an assault rifle and walk out front like something was going to happen. That is just unreasonable fear, and it is a perfect example of the fear that people are feeling right now across the board on all of these issues, whether it be it. race, religion. But, but it's too late. You know, it's not like yeah. we can say, oh, let's ease into this. Let's let the, let them get comfortable with it. Oh, no, we've got to push <laughs> forward. It's like yeah. you guys had how many how many years, how many decades have we been waiting for you to come around? Well, all of world history. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we're three white people talking about it, so it's okay. We're getting right. No, no. I, we, we, I certainly, we certainly have to remember that. that. We are not. We, we don't have the answers, but we, we are, we are hearing that it the problem exists and being, it's yeah, scary. being a part of the solution. I believe that they passionately feel fear, and I do believe that they passionately believe that they are their way Threatened. of life, yeah. their that everything they've ever known is being encroached on and it's terrifying and so mm -hmm. i get that but well oh well taking it back to atheism <laughs> <laughs> uh, i i i think that we have to address these things locally and we have to educate the people around us and work hard to dispel the fear that they're getting from their different sources and and i'm now segueing into our interfaith work which, again go ahead which, wait, which wait, I, I, go there. I there's been a couple of questions let me just ask okay them. yeah so they, they stay in the invocation uh robin canton said that uh he wanted to know do they still do invocations on screen for council meetings online i think they still do right so you know? most of them have not been doing that there are a few places that do the more rural the less urban places have tried to call up a pastor and get them on zoom which is just ridiculous but yeah so not so much but it does happen so we're, maybe we're in florida and florida we don't really want to wear masks apparently and <laughs> we just go where we want and we're the reason there is a florida man meme is because of our florida behavior so <laughs> as a result yes i got a request two weeks ago, a week ago, David, I got, I got an email and they said, Hey, you've got an invocation coming up, by the way, you know, we are wearing masks for this meeting, blah, blah, blah. Are you going to come? And I, I politely said, no, because did you I, give them I, the full explanation of I why did, it was irresponsible? I, did. I was very, very nice. <laughs> and I, I actually, again, I, I spend a lot of time trying to curate these relationships and, and they know me and I know them to some extent. And, and so it's, it's all good. But the point is, is that I'm not going to go in and give an invocation right now. And so I'm not willing to ask any of our members to go in and give an invocation. That would be, in my opinion, unethical of me. So we're turning them down um, because I, I, I won't go in the building. I, I don't blame you. It, it seems silly. The other question we got was Linda Rosa had asked, is the idea to have no in invocations? And she said, is that the goal of the Satanic Temple? I don't, let's not speak on behalf of the Satanic I, I, Temple. Yeah, I, can't. I think what they want is equality. And what that usually results in is secularism. <laughs> because once you have the Satanic Temple participating, um, then you get equality, or excuse me, then you get secularism, which is what 
we don't need any religion here because now we have all the religions, including sat Satanism. So I'll speak for myself, though, yeah. um, and not, not even the CFFC. I'll say, yes, I would prefer not to have invocations. My my in, a, in an ideal world, we could go in and say, oh, it's eight o'clock. Let's start the meeting. That that would be my ideal. And everyone can can pray or think or meditate or do whatever, have a cup of coffee in the time before the meeting. But until that time comes, which I think is going to be some time, I would prefer to keep demonstrating that we can have a message that includes everyone and makes everyone feel good. So I'm gonna continue doing it. Okay, yeah. I agree, I think it sounds great. So let's go to the, let's go to the, the, the segue, go segue, interfaith. Jocelyn. In, in, in <laughs> interfaith. Uh, so I think it was 2011, I, I read an article, I, I read an opinion piece in the Orlando Sentinel, and I said, David, you got to read this. You got to contact this guy. He's he's doing some some really cool stuff, and he sounds like us, and, and he's religious, but read this. And then, David, I'm going to hand this over to you. So then David reaches out to Jim Coffin of the Interfaith Council of Central Florida, which was now I would consider Jim to be a good friend. He actually, he came to our wedding anyway. So David, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Yeah, so, so he, has, he is a uh, Seventh-day Adventist, um, which means he has a perspective on separation of church and state that most conservative religious people don't get, particularly conservative Christians. So he, he was raised as a conservative faith tradition, which is Seventh-day Adventism, but he is um, not as conservative as he used to be. And, and, and he is the executive director of the Interfaith Council right around that time. Um, he became the executive director of the Interfaith Council, and we got to know him. And one of the things the Interfaith Council does here um, is have events where they represent a wide range of traditions. Uh, and I don't use the word faith traditions anymore. I just use the word traditions because atheism, humanism is not a, a tradition of faith. And we were participating since then. Uh, whenever there was an opportunity and, and, and the audience was inviting of a humanist or atheist perspective, we brought it. Uh, sometimes the audiences aren't, sometimes they are, sometimes those are government audiences, sometimes those are private audiences and the rules are different in each of those cases. But so we've been a part of the Interfaith Council's outreach events since 2013, um, sitting on panels, uh, participating in vigils, uh, offering, uh, offering our perspective on issues. And we've been part of the Interfaith Council officially for about two years now, um, something formally called the Executive Committee uh, we were invited to participate on and since then the transition to a, a board of directors is happening right now so it's been it's been a tremendous opportunity jocelyn and i'll let you you know elaborate on any well, particular issue yeah. you have well i i just i this has given us the opportunity for example orlando has a very large mlk day uh celebration that goes on for a week uh, we've been invited to be a part of that and to offer our words of reflection. Uh, David was uh, invited to be on stage during right after Pulse as part of that vigil. Uh, you know, these are opportunities that we would not have had. Uh, we our voice would not have been added unless we had built this this relationship with the organization. Um, I've gone into retirement communities because some of the things that the Interfaith Council does is they, they organize talks that'll go on for like three or four months. And every month or every couple of weeks, maybe a Sikh will come in and then a Hindu will come in and then I will come in and talk about what is a secular humanist or David will go in and, and, and we'll tag team it. And usually he opens with atheism and I close with humanism. And, you know, we, we try to bring a fresh voice onto the panel with that because it, it, we do represent a segment of the, of the population. And we found as a result of working with all of these groups in central Florida, that again, we have more in common than, than uh, apart. And, and while our Sundays might be different, you know, we, we, we are able to get together and break bread and, and go and volunteer together and care about our, our Central Florida community. And that's been really so very important. And that would be something that I would, again, encourage people to be a part of. Um, we've also seen changes in their invocations that they offer by people on the council. Now that they're aware of us in the audience and they know us and they've had lunch with us, you know, every month for a, you know, several years, you know, you know us and you see us out in the audience. And so I'm, I'm hearing different tone of presentation on behalf of the people on the council 
as a result of us being there. Now, maybe I'm reading more into it, but that's that's something that I've also noted. David, I, I think you would agree with that, yes? Yeah, for sure. Definitely things have changed and, and, and we are becoming more of a part of the process. The word interfaith continues to be impossible to uh, change. And I don't mean I don't mean I don't mean it won't change. I mean there's no other word that really works. Uh, if somebody's listening and has a word, then then fire it off and let me have it. You can you can find us on a, uh, at cflfreethought.org. But th the word interfaith is not a turnoff for me because uh, Rabbi David Kay, who actually is the, the our, our liaison to the MLK Day events, um, he says that despite our irreconcilable differences, those of us on the Interfaith Council, um, you know, are together on everything else. Right. We are never going to expect to agree on matters of theology. In fact, across the Jewish spectrum, across the Muslim spectrum, across the Christian spectrum, and certainly with uh, with non non religious folks, we're not going to agree on those things and they are irreconcilable. But we still come together, you know, around the things that we agree on, which is pretty much everything. I like to say that all religions are humanism plus theology. That's a very good point. Yeah, so, so um, what else should we be discussing? I got through my list. Well, um, another thing that we do, which I, I'll brag about, is our volunteer events. Um, and and so part of our, we, we have the social aspect and we have the getting together and the, the cafes and the bar meetups and all of that. But, but we, and when we have the educational meetups, but then we, we also try to engage with our community through volunteerism as well. So we adopted a park um, before COVID, we were going there every month, and that was on the east side of Orlando about a year ago, a year and a half ago. I think we started one on the west side of Orlando as well, uh, where so we're trying to maintain a space. Uh, the east side one, we actually have a sign, and it says Central Florida Free Thought Community, and, and we've actually gotten a couple people from the local community who's who saw us out there cleaning up the park who's now come out and join us and they they hang out we make it social and we always involve donuts and conversation but then we do that <laughs> donuts. Okay. hey if you throw donuts in, right yeah. and uh for what five years we've been doing a uh, book a book and and stem toy drive during the holiday season and then we try to do another one right before they go to summer break to provide these for shelters kids kids who are in need mm -hmm. uh in in large part that's because uh, we see that churches will go in and donate a lot of religious materials, um, you know, small pocket Bibles, things like that. Um, so it wouldn't it be nice to be able to to provide uh, a, a nice STEM toy or things like that. Uh, we have blood drives. We go in and volunteer at food banks and and a variety of other places as well. And we, I want to mention before you move on, Jocelyn, sorry to interrupt, but but something I thought you would have said by now, and I know you, you may be getting to it, but I don't want to forget is that uh, T. Rogers and the group B Orlando Humanist Fellowship are the, the real reason those things happen. And I think that we work in tandem with them. Um, I will say that I'm, I'm not I'm not excited about the number of people that, that come out and participate in those for the amount of people that say I want an opportunity to volunteer and, and help. Um, we don't see as many people as we'd like. You know, we have 10 or 20 people out of the thousand plus, uh, a lot more than that. Yeah, who 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 actually kind of see what we're doing. And some of them may have tuned us out, right? Some of them may not be reading the email. Some of them may not be getting the meetup notifications. But I'd love to see more people helping with that. And if and if we can find some people that are interested in driving that more, um, then that would be great. But uh, but T and the the B organization have been a real important part of that. I, I would, sorry, I didn't, I, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the B Orlando Humanist Fellowship and T Rogers actually fostered a lot of the, she developed the relationship with Second Harvest. She developed uh, the, the relationship with uh, One Blood, which is our, our local uh, blood donation drive area. Uh, she's actually helped us with our tabling events. We, she's part of the reason that we got involved with uh, tabling at Earth Day, which is a big Earth Day celebration here in Orlando. And then Veg Fest, which is a few months, you know, they're opposite ends of the year. So you get to go and table twice a year. Another thing we do as well as tabling is we all, we've, we've participated in the Women's March, um, the, the March for Science. Uh, pride. We, we tried to get out and march with pride. But one interesting thing, which I think a lot of people wouldn't think about, is Veterans Day. Uh, we've, we've marched in the Veterans Day parade a few times here in Orlando. And I, for us, we have to pay to, to march. And I don't know if it's the same in everybody's 
areas, but that's how it is here. And Pride is actually pretty darn expensive. It's very popular. <laughs> Orlando Pride is huge. It's a week long celebration and you have to pay some serious money, comparatively speaking, to be a part of it. But Veterans Day, not not that much to participate and you get to be on tv it's live they they film you as you're walking down and um I, so, and they read they read something that we write too so we always make sure we include the a word you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um think about veterans day it's it's one of those things where um you know i Technically, David served in the military. I mean, you you don't know who's who's been in the military, and there are atheists in foxholes. And uh, right, and just because I don't want to pledge allegiance to a flag, which I, I technically don't particularly want to, but I still have grown up here, and and I'm an American at this point in my life. So, you know, hey, I I respect the people that that do hard work for the military in that sense. David, do you have anything to add? No, no, I, I, Jocelyn did a fantastic job. I think, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point now where we're giving away t-shirts for people to come and participate and we're in red, white, and blue or red, black, and blue for the uh, Veterans Day Parade and the rainbow colors for the Pride Parade and, and actually the Satanic Temple startup organization kind of marched with us uh, last year as they were starting to form. And it was a, it's a great synergy and a, and a lot of fun. And, you know, we have, um, the spring and the fall are the right times for these things and we you know we, we make the best of it i think that the group we've got is really strong and i'm really proud of them and it's been a, it's been a, a lot of the big development process over the years uh, and we've got our hands in a lot of things and you know we're looking for people that want to get involved in in leadership and event hosting and stuff like that and and i think it's unfortunate that we've got a pause on all of this but we'll be back strong you know and better you're regrouping. Hmm? you're regrouping and getting yourself organized and getting the things done that you need to do i know i'm I'm certainly, um, you know, I'm not on the road like I should have been for 2020, but I, I'm doing, I feel like I'm organizing things better. We're re mm -hmm. redoing our training into different languages. There's a lot of things we're just saying, okay, we haven't had time to do this. Let's just sit down and do this. Yeah, Get it done. yeah that's right. Okay. I, I'm organizing my photos and my, my, my <laughs> videos. And, you know, it's, if I'm not organized when this is done, I have wasted some time. I know, but I, I, but I have the same feeling. But I do want to I do want to say that you know we have a lot of a lot of our, our members and supporters um, who continue to support us, but a lot of our members who have been significantly affected by uh, coronavirus. We've had oh, some yeah. people that we know um, die. Uh, we've had a lot of people with family members involved, and and honestly, you know, one of the one of the most huge impacts is financially. Um, Orlando is a tourist destination, and we are probably going to end up closing down again in a couple of weeks, if not sooner. I think we should probably already have done that because we're riding up this, mm -hmm. the rest of this first wave. Um, we have friends um, and other uh, others who are are not working right now and are, are out of the service industry, the restaurant industry, and other types of businesses, and our hearts go out to them, um, and, uh, and we certainly hope to see them on the other side of this because the hugs are going to be great. Oh, yeah, that's a great, nice way of saying it. I think we should probably end it here because the neighbor next door is decided he's going to start doing drilling on his something. <laughs> I can hear him. I'm like, oh, great. I can imagine. Let's, as long as he yeah. doesn't bring the Harley out because that's really loud. <laughs> well, let's quickly plug the websites then. And I know you yes, said you'll put please. them in the notes too. So uh, Jocelyn, if I miss something, let me know. I'll just go through them real quick. So we've got the Central Florida Free Thought community at cflfreethought.org and also on social media at cflfreethought. Uh, the Florida Humanist Association at floridahumanist.org uh, and also uh, freeflow.org for the conference. And the Freethought Cruise is at freethoughtcruise.com. Jocelyn, what else? Yeah, um, I, I would say uh, also if you're on Facebook, uh, pretty much if you follow the Central Florida Freethought community on Facebook, you're going to hear about all of that anyway. Um, so that would be an easy way to just get locked into if you're interested in coming to Florida in a few years or taking a cruise or coming to the conference, then just follow them, us on, on, on Facebook and eventually it'll pop up and it'll be like, yeah, we're, we're starting up again. So that's I, where- I'm Looking forward to those days, trust me. Yes. Well, it's been great talking to you too. This has really been fun. I've learned a lot and I've been watching a little scroll go back and forth on your- Oh, Jocelyn's Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Yeah, yeah, and I have a bright light there, sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right, I, I, I'm okay with that, but boy, it was nice to watch a little scroll because we don't really see a lot of scrolls in my area. I don't know why, but 
it, we, but it was just he, he's been going uh, he or she has been going back and forth at your fence and it's been quite entertaining to watch there's plenty of food out there that's why they're here you gotta oh, put we food actually out actually feed them oh we well i have a bird i have a bird feeder like right on the other side of that window and it's just so neat to hear them and i, I just love yeah. being around nature that's kind of really helped a lot being locked in is to be able to look out your window and say oh mm -hmm. life will be okay someday <laughs> right we'll get back to normal someday i've got my oh. butterfly book and oh, my bird book and my binoculars and yeah so jocelyn you were talking about a funny video all things that people are doing while we're locked in right now and, and certainly butterflying and birding are are hitting the list <laughs> yeah yeah i was watching a video and they they were doing a parody of a song of born in the usa boy it was bored in the usa <laughs> and and he, at the beginning, he says, yeah, I've taken up birding, which David, when I met David, he was doing a lot of birding. And recently, David said, you know, I think we should start working with the butterflies, too, and identifying him. At the end of this song I heard yesterday, the guy said the same thing. He said, now I'm cataloging bird, you know, butterflies. And I'm like, what? We're not the only ones. We have to label everything. It is our human nature to label everything. I have to know what you are called by me, even though you have no idea what it is. I, I know. know your name. Let me, let me and, encourage you as you go through your photos, especially um, Wikimedia Commons. Please upload photos okay. to us so we can use them on those Wikipedia pages. If if you do that, please send me your your. Um, uh the account that you make for your uh your username because mm -hmm. what i do is there's a portion of my training for gsow they have to add a photo to a page so i have this huge spreadsheet so people on my team what they do is when they go someplace and they they take some pictures of some you know museum that's not got a lot of photo photos on wikipedia or whatever old barns things that and what i do is i i have they pick something off the spreadsheet and they have to go and upload it to a wikipedia well they have to add it to a Wikipedia page because only the photographer can add it to Wikimedia. But once it's on Wikimedia, then we can use it on Wikipedia. And it's a lesson that my, my team has to cross off because they have to add a photo. What we okay. badly need is, is photographs of people in our community that are notable enough to have Wikipedia pages. We're having so much trouble with people not having a nice picture of themselves that is, you know, you got to do professor and we write a Wikipedia page for them, and then we can't, we 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 spend months trying to get them to upload a photo of them. First off, they don't have one. Second, they don't know how to upload it, and it just drives me crazy. See these Wikipedia pages, nothing on them. So uh, if you guys, okay, you know, can can give us a little bit. One of the things we do is we hook up with whoever your photographer is for each conference, mm -hmm. and so we'll go through your speaking you're speaking uh who your speakers are and we'll go that person right there we don't have a picture of like uh you had bertha vasquez mm -hmm. uh, we love she's her amazing. She, was at, uh, she was at psycon last year we have not been able to write her a wikipedia page she's not wikipedia notable mm -hmm. uh, the ties program i can't remember if we were able to do that yet or not but right. so we have we have photographs of her at, because we work with people who are the photographers for psycon and stuff but you know we would love to have more photographs. So as you go through, upload them to Wikimedia Commons here and there, label them so we know what it is we're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> and then let me know your usernames. And anybody okay. else that are watching, please do the same thing because we really need photographs badly. I mean, we had to have somebody go chase down that Bay Bay Church um, cross when we were running the David. Oh, Sur Bayview, Bayview Church. I had Bay Bayview ask, Park. Yeah. yeah. I had to go on Facebook and say, does anybody live near this? Can you just please take a picture <laughs> of that and upload it to Wikimedia for me? And somebody did. Yeah. We have, I, nobody thinks to do that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the Wikipedia page doesn't have it. And it's like, you know, it's an easy thing to do. Well, so, definitely yeah. keep us on the list of, of uh, places where you can get photos for the conference. We have <laughs> okay. we have a photographer every year in the last several years. So if you know, I, we, we don't have a, a lot of ob obscure speakers, um, you know, on the national level. Uh, we were searching for more and more of those kind of folks, but we certainly have some Florida speakers who may be page worthy. And I know what you mean by page worthy. It's not that they're not good enough. It's that they have to have notoriety in a certain way. Specific yeah. Notoriety. It's really hard. We it's it's. It's, it's not just a given. You, it's not like yep. you're writing a website for somebody. It has the standards. And so, I mean, if yep. anybody wants to understand that better, they can get in touch with me, but it is not, you know, but we'd like to have them in the can. We'd like to have those <laughs> pictures in case we need them yeah. for 
for whatever reason, it's it's a good idea to publicize our community. In, in the can, spoken like a true film photographer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, put it in the can. Well, it was great to talk to you both, you guys. Thank you so much for giving me two hours of your day. Oh my It was God. fun. Yeah, it went fast, so huh? Much. I learned yeah. a lot and I hopefully a lot of people will will be um, watching. I'll um, upload this to YouTube. And if people want to be in touch, they will get in touch. I'll put the links that you give me in there and um, uh, I'll show you the link with you on YouTube if you want to use it for Twitter or whatever you want to do. But okay. this will remain on Facebook Live for Great. ever. Forever and ever, as long as Facebook <laughs> is around. <laughs> and then they'll go to Wikimedia. Then they'll go to Wikimedia. I, you know what? I am probably, I, I think that is something I'm going to do is probably upload all these talks to Wikimedia. I've done that with a lot of talks because we have a whole, we have a, um, a whole category that's just talks that are skepticism science related that we we have a talk somewhere we mm -hmm. upload it i've been doing that a lot and it just goes onto wikipedia pages sometimes in the future it's fun that's great that's a way to yeah. contribute it is great all right great yep. to talk to you too bye susan bye, bye jocelyn bye